Charles, thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure. For our viewers who are not very familiar with your work, could you just briefly introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Charles Cecil. I am the founder and the main designer of adventure games for a company called Revolution, uh, founded in 1990. But I actually go back to 1981. I wrote my first adventure game for the Sinclair ZX81, and we had 1K of memory. A lot of history there. Yeah. Uh, of which, so you founded Revolution in 1990, and uh, you were basically uh, sharing the market with other iconic companies like Lucas here and so Can you share some of your fondest memories of this is what we call the golden age of the adventure? Sierra, I saw as our main competitor because I knew very little about LucasArts. LucasArts was only just before us. Mm -hmm. So Sierra, I felt were taking themselves much too seriously. If you got if you got if you took games like uh, King's Quest, you know it's King Graham of Daventry, and it's this you know ludicrous view of England, you know medieval England, none of which had any authenticity whatsoever. King Graham of Daventry, you know Daventry is a a place where jumbo jets land. It, like it, it's not the place where there is a kingdom. I think that had I known more about LucasArts, I would have been really scared because LucasArts were also. Uh, uh, Tim Schafer once said that they were responding to the fact that Sierra was taking itself too seriously in the same sort of way. So we were both going down a very different, well, we were, we were after the same objective, and that was to create humor in our games. But obviously they were going down a slapstick route, and we were going down the idea of a serious story, but ludicrous situations. And Sierra fell out of favor quite quickly, and obviously LucasArts came to prominence because they are brilliant. Um, but one of the amazing things about adventure games is that we don't compete with each other because if somebody buys Monkey Island 3, which came out at the same time as Broken Sword 2, they're not going to buy one and not the other. They're going to buy both because they love adventure games. So I don't see them as competitors. I don't see other um, developers as competitors either because we're all, we, 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 we get on very well, we share ideas. Because ultimately, if the industry grows and if adventures grow in particular, then we will do well. But to answer your question, so I founded the company in 1990 with um, two programmers uh, and, and Noreen. But the two programmers were based in a city called Hull. And I was, I was working for Activision at the time, and I, was, I wasn't very rich. And I had a 386, a, a PC 386, which was so wonderful. I played, um, uh, it was my pride and joy, and I played flight simulators on it. And I lent it to the boys. It was worth an awful lot of money. I mean, I think I bought it for about fifteen hundred pounds, and that was in nineteen ninety. So that was that was several months of wages. I mean, it was a big, big, big thing. And they had to promise to look after it. And we wrote a, a prototype, and we were going to present it to Mirasoft, who was our publisher at the time. And I told the guys that they had to, when they drove down, I would meet them in London, but they had to wrap it up and strap it in like a, like a child. They had to look after it. So they did, they strapped it in and that was fine. And they drove down and they arrived and everything was fine. And we had a glass of wine and we, we um, then had dinner and we talked about what we we're gonna do, drunk a bit too much. Woke up in the morning and I looked out and somebody had smashed the car window to steal the, um, to steal the car radio. And suddenly I realized I'd forgotten to unpack the PC. We hadn't backed it up. If the PC, and my heart sunk, that was gonna be the end of revolution. And I went down and I ran down to the car and the radio had been stolen. And in the back, still strapped in was the PC. And had that not happened, we, revolution would, would definitely, definitely not exist. So a little bit shaken, I went and I gave the presentation. And I remember there was something called Bob Jacobs from CinemaWare. And Cinemaware were writing amazing adventure games. Yeah, I mean, they were, they were the absolute stars at the time. And um, I gave uh, the presentation of Lure of the Temptress to this, to this room. And I finished, and there was silence. And I looked around, and then somebody started clapping. And then everybody started clapping. And then people stood up, clapping. And then they queued to come and talk to me. And I, it just was an amazing feeling. It was like, we've arrived, we've written our first game and it's gonna be good, it's all gonna be all right. But had the PC, had that 386 been taken, that would have been the end, that would have been the end. So I'm not sure that's a good story, I think that's a, a story of, of potential woe. 
launched in 1994. And now, 25 years later, we're doing the sequel that we launched this time. Yeah, I don't normally call it a sequel, though, because it's so different to the original. It is a spiritual continuation. When approaching this type of project, how did your approach change with the added experience of the many years between the two titles? So what I wanted to do was reintroduce this idea of, of what we called, at the time, virtual theatre. And that was the idea that characters walk around in the world and talk to each other and their motivations change based on global events or things that happen. So the weaknesses of virtual theatre in Lure of the Temptress were twofold. The first is that when you gave your helper character instructions, all you could really ask them to do is things that you couldn't do yourself. So we had to come up with a long list of reasons why you couldn't push some bricks or lift this thing up or sneak past this or whatever. And secondly, the characters would walk around it and you could sometimes wait quite a long time for them to come back. You didn't know where they were. And you could go looking for them, but if they were coming around here and you went around here, then it made... So what actually ended up happening is you, you just sit and wait. And it just got a bit boring. And what we did in for... Uh, but the, 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 sorry, that was for Lure and Temptress. But beneath the steel sky, there was one particular puzzle where you could go in and you could change the authority of one of the characters. And it meant that he couldn't then take the elevator, which then opened up opportunities because he gave you his card, which meant that you could go and do things. And that felt really exciting, but we never really made very much of it. And then when we went on to Broken Sword, then there was no virtual theater whatsoever. And the big change, I guess, is the ability to use uh, Unreal Engine, which we love, which gives us the opportunity to create a very rich 3D world. But rather than a, a, a massive, great game world, what we have is like arenas where every character has a, a function both in terms of the narrative, but also in terms of the gameplay. So as you go around talking to these, you learn more and more about the situation. And as you do so, so the solution to the puzzles, the things that are blocking you from, from progressing, hopefully become clearer and clearer. And, and that means it's really worth, it's not a case of using the porcelain goat on the window and it smashes and somebody, it's, it's a case of coming up with logical puzzles in the world and the more you explore the world, hopefully the clearer the solution will become. Because I love the idea of writing adventures where nobody actually needs hints and people play it at their own pace. That's very much the vision for the game. So speaking of the virtual theater, can you tell us a little bit more about how that works? And does it uh, influence, um, how does it benefit the game exactly? And how maybe does it influence the development process in any way? It, it does. It's, a, it's quite a complex development process because there are so many permutations. But what virtual theater creates is an arena in which you have characters that are motivated. And you need to learn what those motivations are. So in the simplest example, you've got these really vicious birds with razor sharp beaks and they love food. So if you can give them food, then they'll behave in a certain way. But they can become very aggressive, but they are afraid of loud noises. So once you know one of those, when you come across a puzzle, then on top of that, but humans are much more complex and they tend to have human emotions. So the way to determine that is to talk to them and find out what they need. Droids tend to have you know, something in between. They, they have human characters, but then they behave in, 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 in preset ways. So what you do is you go into the world and you learn how these characters are motivated and what you're going to have to do to change those motivations. And one of the powerful ways of doing it is to go and subvert the Internet of Things, the computer system, which we call Minos, and you can actually move commands around and unexpected things then happen and characters then respond to those unexpected things. And that's really quite a powerful tool because we give the player quite a degree of scope to change the things within the world. But then we need to make sure that we've accounted for all the potential outcomes that come from that. So it's exciting and I, I, I hope it works. The people we've shown it to so far appear to be very excited. So, you know, we, we've got great enthusiasm. And also, you know, we have a lot of experience at writing stories. So hopefully the stories and the puzzles will, will, will interweave well so that because you know, one of the things I always say is an adventure game should have a story that's driven forward by the puzzles. You solve the puzzles to move forward. But conversely, those puzzles are bound into the story. So they make sense. They're not, if you, if you, if you find yourself coming to an adventure game and it's really obvious that there's a blocker that's got nothing to do with the story, it's just simply there to delay progression, then you break that sense of immersion. 
Whereas if you come across a puzzle that is interlinked deeply with the story, then you get the satisfaction of solving that puzzle and knowing that it's going to drive forward the, the story within a context. This is our last question and uh, something we ask all our interviewees. If you want to give one piece of advice to someone who's at their beginning of their career, developing games, maybe even adventure games, what would that advice be? You have to write a game. You have to write a game. And if it's in a game jam, then great. Game jams are wonderful. Four or five very passionate people, two days, write an adventure game using all the tools in the world. Use anything that you can. But before you would judge somebody probably by their qualifications, now you judge them by what they produce. Because if you've written a game, it shows, one, you have the ambition and the drive, the organization, the creativity, all of those things come together. Write a game. What I, what I like to say is that Angry Birds was, could have been written by four students, or the prototype could, because the physics engine, which was by far the most complex part of Angry Birds, was, was, was public domain. So a really good artist to draw, a really good game designer to design the things, and, and, and the first two levels could have been written in no time at all. That's, I think, really, that's the only, you know, have the drive, have the drive and the ambition to create your own games. Thank you so much. It's lovely talking to you.